Yes, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this conference. It's, uh, it's the first time in Mexico and I'm having really fun. It's a great place to be, the food, the people and everything has been great. Thank you very much for this. And it will not be the last time I come, it will be recurrent. Okay. Uh, this paper is joined with uh, my co-author and friend Itash, who is sitting in the back too, and Michael Simatane, my colleague at the University of Toronto. Uh, Rotman School of Management. Okay, let me start first by just stating some facts why we wrote this paper. And it's, it's actually good to place this paper at the end of the conference because it's a really simple paper. And then it's uh, something that after all this great papers, it will be easier to probably to grasp. The fact that I'm trying to talk about is this for active equity funds really is an important area, in my opinion. It grows just recently from 5.9 to 7.7 in 2013. More of, it's 98 million individual US investors that held the money in actively managed fund. Important to those people, and it's important asset under management. And by the same time, there is an amount of evidence that those active managers, what they call themselves active managers, are actually negatively generating negative returns. And but some of them apparently possess skills. The question then is, who are these guys? There's a pool of active guys, but only some of them probably take good returns. And then the question that we're trying to answer, but we're not the first one, there are many people before us. And, uh, in fact, the people before us provided the motivation for writing this paper. And the reason for that is, I think it's, if you work in this area, these are very <coughs> well-known facts which is some of these measures, and in the back of my mind, I have four measures. I'm just trying to simplify, I have R square in my mind, and below the vehicle, I have active shares, returns gap, and industry concentration. These are the four, there may be others, and they are. I'm just focusing on these four for the presentation. And why are measures positioned with respect to those who provide an additional value? First of all, some of the problems is that you need to identify benchmarks, which is sometimes not actually known. You need either to specify an asset factor models, you need a long time series, and then by knowing this, sometimes for many funds that are young, you don't have a long time series to do that. At the same time, in order to run regression, you need to assume that the fund attribute and the management team are remaining stable on the whole life of the funds, which is some of the big assumptions, some of the measures are really falling. A recent article, I really want to mention, which come up after we wrote the paper, which is really interesting that uh, these three guys from uh, AQR, uh, they wrote an interesting paper that basically publicized what everybody actually knows. But they have a skill in the game where they do it. They actually work in a fund from which it was ranked low, given an active share. And they wrote basically a paper showing that these measures, especially active share, doesn't work, and why. And I refer you guys to the paper if you want to have an interesting read of uh, some of the criticism of the literature. Okay, these are about the general facts that motivate us to write this paper. What we do, and literally when I say simple, it's really simple. We take a fund, I want the holding of that fund. I only know, I, we only need the holding of the fund and the market cap of the firms that I know the fund. We value those, value well, and we took a difference between what is the real weight minus the value weight. And I don't really understand why this reasoning makes sense or doesn't make sense. Is it ad hoc or not ad hoc? But I want to first, before I move on, to be clear about what is it. I will need to know the benchmark. One well, of the reasons for this, I'll get back to it. I'll, I'll, I just want to first give you a snapshot of the results, but this is what is the measure. As simple as that. Take a fund. Evaluate everything, do a difference of real weight minus the value weight, sum them all, compute the absolute value, and call that measure active weight. What we're going to show you guys is that it predicts performance measured in different other ways, measured using net return, gross returns, fund flows, asset flows, and so forth. We're going to show that the measurement of active weight, or so the predictability that active weight provided, is orthogonal to the four other measures that I mentioned previously. 
And we're going to claim that it's the only measure that measures performance in the long run, not only within one month, three months, as has been shown in the previous lecture. OK. Now let's a little bit, and I'm going to move fast later on about the tables, because everybody here knows that around the tables, the TSAT, I will move fast. But I want to first a little bit just hammer why we thought about it, and to see what is the challenge. Because the idea comes as simple as that. If you get two decisions a manager is going to make, select stock and weight that stock, how much is going to buy from that stock? The first decision is about the selection from a universe that is allowed to work. The second one is to assign a weight to that stock in this Now we think that the first decision is extremely challenging for many, many reasons. One of them is a very famous paper by Sansoy who shows that, and I read from him, almost one-third of actively managed diversified U.S. equity mutual fund specifies size and value in the prospectus, but it doesn't match really the fact the fund actual stuff. It's a fund per benchmark. Even if it's stated, it doesn't really represent what is the actual. Because we don't really need to know the benchmark for this. And that's become extremely challenging to identify skills given the first decision. Now we think the second decision is probably easier and we will say why a deviation from value weights makes some sense, even if it's extremely simple. Simple is not bad sometimes. When a fund manager does some research, he does a research to overweight or underweight some stocks. And we think that by actually just deviating from value weights for the following reasons, it's actually going to be a sign that he's not or she's not a closet indexer which is literally probably an active fund manager. Why is this? Two main reasons, in my opinion. If you take almost all exchange-traded funds, market indices, all the benchmarks in the Kramer and Peter Gisto paper, they are all valuable. It means if you follow those benchmarks, to mimic those benchmarks, a closed indexer is more likely to be a value index, a value index. Means now you've got something you're trying to be, you're trying to be like. In order to be like them, if you're a closed indexer, you're going to select some of those stocks, take them across the 2000, you're going to take the, ma the max market cap, take it, value it to be as close as possible to those things. The other paper shows that also internationally, value weighting is huge. It means the simple idea is this. If I know that all the benchmarks are valuable in the US and internationally, an easy task for a closed indexer is to basically just evaluate the main important stocks. And then one way for us to identify who is active versus a closet one is to identify potentially a deviation because this guy who is doing some research on the back, he may overweight something, underweight something else, mm -hmm. and the difference somehow can give you a sign of, of, uh, of skills. Other benefit of this measure, as I said, it only requires the holdings, the market cap. It's also very useful for pension fund, endowment, hedge fund that does not need to disclose returns. It's now talking the back of my mind about return gap and the industry considerations, as you don't need to know the returns of those funds. Very difficult to have an asset price and model for international, and it's sometimes the time series is not allowed. It is very difficult to do the elsewhere. And young fund with short time series, it's again very difficult to come up with a reasonable elsewhere. Is we think those are some of the benefits again of the active weight. And the slide before is why we thought about active weight could be an interesting measure because we focus on the second decision rather than the first decision, which is great, but we cannot do it. We don't know how to do it. Yet. Some snapshot of what these guys are. What is the data we have? We have data from 1980 to 2013. 2,790 distinct fund. 700 million is the average of the fund. Every fund holds around 100. And nine years returns. And it's important to see this large four here, which is the previous measurement, which we have a little bit of very low correlation with the previous measures. Means, and that we're going to talk about that a little bit more later. But I just want to focus that we're capturing some orthogonal side to the average. Again, some insight about the active weight measurement. 
first signal that we may be picking something. We took all the passive funds, not the active ones, the passive ones, and we computed the active weights, and it's around zero. We took all the active funds, it's on average 40 and it's down on sloping. And basically to me this is very important because it shows you that at least the type 2 errors are we picking up some of the passive one is active and the answer is no. Is this active weight some kind of random thing? Someone comes up today to be high active weight, tomorrow is not active weight, and I'm using active weight just because that's the best name we could come up with. Active share exists, we look at what we're doing, we we'll weight active weights. And uh, if you have a better name, let us know. But we couldn't come up with a better one. So active weights probably end up. These are sorted by the quantile, the best, like the highest active weight, the lowest active weight. These are months. And what it shows is, is a persistence of the active weight guys, of the active guys given our measurement to stay active for a long run. Remember, this picture is going to be neat for the long-term performance. <coughs> okay, this is the first kind of quantitative results, and I'm going to move a little bit faster than those because I think in this area, people do it all the time. We basically try to just sort, and this is not like a high mind, it's not like a short in something or long in something. This is just a difference in, if you sort by active weight from the lowest active weight to the highest active weight, highest being the guy who's more active given our measurement, the lowest being the guy who's as close to a value weight. We see that the one that deviate from value weight generate 2.63% on gross return annually compared to the one that are not given our measurement, sticking more to the value weight. Gross return, net returns, we also decompose it to from where this performance comes from, is it time? Is it style? And it's important to identify something. We do this within style. It means the style is not actively predicting our result. It's within style. Later on, going to be a robustness outside style, but that's a minor point. We show that main return is coming from the characteristics of selectivity. Now, this is going to provide, oh, you guys are saying you don't have any decisions on how they select stuff. But the measurement of Damien and others show you it's coming from selectivity. But remember, overweight in something, or underweight in something, it's a decision of selecting more of that stuff. And this is from where it's coming. Because this is actually the, in my opinion, this is, this is the whole thing, to be honest. We identify that these guys make a persistent, and they're going to come to the persistent part, 2.43 net returns after expenses for this pool that identify themselves as active, there's large variation, and the one that our measure identify seems to predict performance. Of course, we're on this. We look at is this a risk or is this alpha? We do this in both unconditional, unconditional, and the results hold. You got 2.55 again, 2.33 net. The same thing for the conditional person, 2.64 and 2.43. These are the loadings. I want to focus a little bit on what's going on in that thing here. This has took us a lot of time. From where this performance is coming from? But I agree with you guys, as you are doubted why. Is there a theory somewhere that guy that this active no, no. But for the time being, we're just controlling this MB, and we still find returns. And the question that bothers us a lot, and it's also, and we thank person for this, is that he, he identified a lot of, of uh, of these things to be major work for us, which is why we still see a monotonic relationship when it comes to the SMB factor. And probably this is driven by the fact that we hold in both small stocks in the way we actively weigh, in the, in the way our measures probably pick up. And we're going to spend some time just to show that probably that's not the case. Because even if you control on it, we know there's a linear regression, whatever, that probably there is something out there. We do kind of Many robustness to this table to make sure, or to the first table to make sure that what we identify is not driven by the small stock and it's not driven by the way we, we measure active weight in terms of value weight and stuff. What do we do? And I'm going to move a little bit fast into those just to give you a flavor. And we're only going to report the high minus low, and we have an appendix if you're interested. 
you can see all the amount. What we say, if it's coming from the SMB stocks, the SMB, what we're going to do is that we're going to control, we're going to construct a market. The first, oh, I'm going to go a bit uh, fast. We control an index, an equally weighted market factors. We orthogonalize, we construct that market factor that is equally weighted, which is orthogonal to the market, which is a famous way to do it. And then we control for it for the SMB. We exclude the small stock into the measure. We condition on the lag SMB level. We use the time in which the negative, it was a negative SMB returns, which means now it's impossible to stem from SMB, but we still found the results very strong. It means just from the fact that the SMB, it's not, our results are not driven by small stocks. Given five different robustness, and we feel a little bit confident, and plus controlling for the SMB itself, we feel a little bit confident that it's not coming from them. I'm going to skip the other things to talk about quickly that we have also shown that the alpha is not coming from volatility time. Because there is this concern that the Daniel and L measure, which is focusing on selectivity, market timing, it's not controlling for the volatility being the volatility negatively related to the time. And we found that actually not coming from that, and our alpha is still persistent 2.06. I'll skip the multivariate analysis, but we don't have some time. Just one minute on this one. Everything so far was on the univariate analysis. For the multivariate analysis, we just had the change to control for other measures other than the active weights. And then what we show still is significant with the four factors, still is driven by the characteristic activity. And in this example, we want to spend some time doing something different. So far, we've been talking about performance as being returns. But at the mutual fund, there's other thing that matters, which is asset growth, fund flow, and this new paper by Burke and, uh, and someone else. Sorry. Hmm? Van Dysburg. Van Dysburg paper, sorry if uh, mispronouncing. Uh, who uh, act, <laughs> mispronouncing? Just say Jules. <laughs> <laughs> Jules and uh, Burke. To actually show that actually we should, if you want to really test any performance of the mutual fund, you should look at value added. We did that too, and we showed that in fact the value added. Our measurement predict both performance in terms of returns, characteristic selectivity, asset growth, fund flows, and value added. This is this is an important table for me when you. When you have already four measures in an area, it's very important to say and to hammer the point that we're not having an intersection. And the first thing that I showed you about the correlation is never enough. Because as we know, in anything that you measure, unless it's linear, correlation doesn't mean anything. And then you might end up with different other properties when you correlate the distributions. What we do here is that's basically simple. We, can, we regress the active weight, which is our measurement, on each one of those factors. We, can, we pick up the error terms, which is the orthogonal, and we sort with the orthogonal. And we still found that we have an extra information that is coming up from the fact that it's not in the active share, in the return gap, and in the output. Again, same thing. I didn't mention the persistence about that. I didn't mention what do we do in terms of two years, one year, five years, if somebody is skilled or talented, is he going to be good only for two months or one month? Because the majority of these things are one month return. In this paper, actually, and we found it surprising we don't find these results in the other paper. Why we don't actually look at two, three, and five years? And what we do, and recall it was persistent, these are actually basically sorted and holding the position for 20 months. This is the high active weight, and the second one, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. And we found that the high active weight, from where all the performance comes, there is a persistent of when it comes to performance for as long as 20. We do it 20 months, 20 quarters, sorry. We do it also in a different way, for which we do the exercise also for the industry concentration, return gaps, active share, and R square. And we sort, we do it in these cells, and we hold it again for five years. 
and we found that it's actually significant for us, not for the others. We do this exercise using this eyes, using uh, quantiles, and also just a half half. It means, in a sense, that we include here. What we have done so far is to introduce or present a literally extremely simple measure that requires two things I need to know whenever you are up internationally. I need to know your market. I need to know which holding you have and what is the market cap of those holdings. I will need to know the benchmark. I will need to have the longer time series. I will need to understate or overstate some benchmarks. And we show that we actually do well in terms of all measures of performance, active, which is returns, gross and net, fund flows, value added, and, uh, and uh, assets under management. We also show that no measure of manager activeness is perfect. We know that that's our our problem, but I want to first say this because I don't want to forget it. The only measure that have predicted performance from over horizons we have a problem with our measure. I think it's a main problem because we're silent about what the heck these things are coming from. We, I don't know. We don't measure. We actually even thinking of this as being a low down because we're actually silent about the part that is selecting the stock to start with within the universal benchmark. But as I mentioned before, somebody selecting stock A. You have no idea what is the real benchmark. You have no idea what is in this mind with the research. It's extremely difficult to say what is that. And I think we are, we, we put all our, the last thing which I think is important in this literature in my opinion, we put all our the results and the code and everything in the website and we, please guys use the measure, it's there, everything is there. And if you find any flaws or any mistake or you cannot replicate anything, I'll feel very happy to communicate with you guys and the website and everything is. Yeah, well, well, thanks very much for having me. Um, really a pleasure to be down here, and I enjoyed reading the paper very much. Um, I guess uh, as, as, as much as I appreciate this opportunity, I should put two caveats with challenges that I face here as a, as a discussant. One is uh, I'm not the only one that stands between this group and happy hour after this. Uh -huh. um, the, the, the second and slightly more substantial challenge here is uh, uh, this paper. Um, as the, the uh, distinguishing feature of being a forthcoming paper in the review of, uh, re review of asset pricing studies. My understanding is that it was accepted quite recently, so congratulations to the author on that. It seems like they're getting great traction here. Um, given this sort of forthcoming nature of the, uh, of the paper, the ability to make constructive comments is a little bit diminished. So I'm going to take the, uh, the opportunity to talk a little bit more about positioning and what I think we've learned from this, and maybe some of the, out of some of these comments um, you know, come some opportunity for future research or other ways to look at some of these questions. Um, let me just start with the big picture. So the, 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 the big question that we're focused on here is just, do active mutual fund managers have skill? Do they have some ability to beat their benchmarks, to generate uh, alpha? Um, the sort of answers we have to this question are, you know, we start off with that sort of negative starting point. So going back all the way to Jensen in 68, it kind of looks like on average, actually managed mutual funds have, uh, at least after uh, fees and expenses, have a negative alpha. So there's not much evidence, if any, that there's sort of average performance of these mutual funds. There's a remaining question out there is, well, are, do some funds have uh, some sort of scale? Are, are there some funds out there that can generate positive alpha? It's a tough question, because there are all sorts of different dimensions that we could sort funds on. Um, so we've got to come up with some way of having some theory or some motivation for why I would look at a, a particular variable. If I can motivate it sufficiently, um, kind of come up with a rationale for why that's a reasonable way of splitting the data, and then show that there's alpha according to that sort, it's going to make me think that maybe there is this subset of funds that does have scale. So a few approaches that people have taken, and this is just a small subset of a very large literature. At first, the, the sort of Carhartt approach of let's just sort based on past performance. It looks like if you sort based on past performance, at least based on raw returns, um, you know, there's not much there. You basically explain it with the four-factor model. There's a little bit more recent work that suggests if you look at the holdings returns as opposed to the fund returns, um, and you sort based on kind of past fund alpha as opposed to past fund returns, um, maybe there's some persistence there. Uh, there's another kind of approach we could take is look at characteristics of the managers. You have the Chevalier and Ellison result that there's some characteristics of the managers that seem to predict some aspects of both beta and alpha funds. 
the, the literature that this paper find, uh, um, falls into is uh, this dimension of does the level of activeness um, tell us something about skill? So are funds that are more active than other funds, in particular kind of more actively managed funds as opposed to closet indexers? Is there more skill there? And there are several existing papers that suggest that's the case. So the industry concentration, active share, and R squared are all kind of measures of this, how active is the underlying management? And all three of these papers have results that suggest you know, the funds that are most active maybe have some positive alpha relative to funds that are closet indexing. Um, active weight very much fits into that category. Uh, so I, I see the contributions of the paper as kind of twofold. So the, the first con con contribution is additional evidence of this sort of activeness dimension. So we have these three papers that suggest that um, these mutual funds that are most active seem to have the most skill. I, I think this is pretty compelling additional evidence in favor of that finding. Uh, so we have, we have a new measure that I think has some intuitive appeal, probably has some additional benefits. Um, it's not all that highly correlated with some of the other measures. And we get the, the same basic result, actually stronger results for active weight than for some of, these other, uh, for some of these other measures. So I think this is nice additional evidence that this sort of activeness tells us something about, uh, about skill. Um, this is our second potential contribution of the paper, and I think maybe where there's, uh, there's room to focus a little bit more is, you know, to what extent is this a better measure of activeness? So th there's something uh, it's better on this dimension of it's, it's easy, intuitive to calculate. Maybe I can take it across some, some areas in which I can't apply some of the other measures. Um, empirically, it seems to be the best predictor of future performance. Um, although I think there's, this, uh, there's a bit of a distinction between is it it's one thing to be a better predictor of future performance. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a better predictor of activeness. Um, so that, that's one thing I want to focus some attention on here. And, and I think the paper conflates these things a little bit. Of, you know, this, the, the, I think the first point of the measure has to be coming up with a proxy for activeness. And then you use that proxy to say whether or not activeness is related to skill, as opposed to skipping straight to interpreting this sort of active weight as a direct measure of skill. Um, so I, I want to think more seriously about you know, to what extent um, you know, is this a, a more accurate measure of activeness or does it capture some dimension of activeness that's kind of different or more important than uh, some of these other measures. Um, okay, so what is, uh, what is activeness? Um, this is something I struggle with a little bit. Uh, you sort of have, I think, three classes of funds that we want to think about here. One, you have sort of passive index funds. Which are clearly passive investment. You're just buying the S&P 500 index or some other index. You've got active funds that are actively seeking stocks. They're going to pick their stocks, they're going to choose uh, stocks they think are going to outperform the market. And then you have closet index funds that kind of look like they're active funds. They're not index funds, but uh, they're not really pursuing active investments. So probably a couple of different categories of these. And I, 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 I think the paper seems to be saying more about kind of funds that are kind of look and market it as active, but not really delivering active results. I think of Fidelity Magellan as maybe being an example there, just a big actively managed mutual fund that basically gives you the S&P 500. Um, th there's also another class of funds that are intentionally passive but not index funds. So I think DFA, for example, is clearly a passive investment strategy, but it's not an index fund. Um, I think that we would put this into this closet index bu bucket. The, the goal of this sort of activeness measure is to distinguish these two types of funds. So I want to figure out, uh, distinguish the true active funds from the closet indexers, one thing I struggle with more is, should I think about this as just a discrete, either a fund is active or it's a closet indexer, or should I think about this as a spectrum, that there are some funds that are more active than other funds, and you know, it just, I, I struggle a little bit with how to think about what I'm really trying to measure here. Um, okay, so active weight. Um, active weight sort of starts with this, uh, this sort of premise that there's basically two decisions that the uh, a manager needs to make, what to invest in, how much to invest. Index funds, they're going to invest everything in the index. They're going to evaluate essentially all of the major indices that um, funds are, are, are um, tracked based on or evaluated index. Um, an active fund can do whatever they want. So maybe they choose all the, maybe they evaluate, maybe they don't. Um, the activeness of this first dimension is tough to identify, mostly because we don't see the, uh, we don't know the benchmark index. We don't necessarily know what index they're trying to, um, to, uh, to hit. So, you know, the, the paper here proposes, let's abstract from this and just look at the second dimension. Um, I think the, the presentation talked about this pretty clearly of what they're trying to measure. It's just deviations from value weights. Um, okay, so th there's several alternative measures here. Um, there's already some discussion of this. 
how do you measure how active a fund is? One could be industry concentration. So are you overly invested in the telecommunications industry relative to the S&P 500? It's going to tell me you're not uh, a passive investor. You're actively investing in telecommunications. Active share is going to look at deviations from the benchmark. They face this uh, challenge of what is the benchmark, so the, the Kramer's paper takes the approach of, well, we'll just say how far is the deviation from the best fit benchmark. Uh, R squared is an approach where you say, let's just run a multi-factor regression and let's see how well the multi-factor model explains returns. If you have a, a low R squared, that's going to suggest you're doing something active, uh, can't explain your return, so that's an active fund. Active weight uh, takes another approach. I think from first principles, these are all sort of reasonable measures. I don't think that there's a clear reason to prefer one of these over the other. Um, so I struggle a little bit with you know, making an argument that it seems like this empirically works pretty well, but I don't know that from first principles we would necessarily prefer it. Um, what are we doing in active weight? Conceptually, you have index funds down here are just choosing you know, zero active weight. They're going to buy and um, evaluate the portfolio. Active management with weights unrelated to market capitalization here, you could have type two errors or type one errors. So you, know, you could have passively managed funds that don't value weight. Um, DFA might be a good example here. So DFA is going to uh, pursue a strategy where they buy some subset of uh, small cap funds. Um, and the, the weights that they put on those small cap funds are going to be more opportunistic than tied to the actual value weights. So here would be an example of a passive fund that I suspect actually would have reasonably large active weights. If I want to think about my own portfolio, um, it's entirely passive, but I think it actually would have pretty high active weights. The reason is I'm investing in some in a, a large cap index and then I'm tilting that index towards small stocks and towards small value stocks. If I pursue that sort of investment strategy, I'm going to deviate from value weights, but it's still a passive strategy. So you know, there are going to be some of these type 1 errors. There's also type 2 errors where you know, active funds, um, yeah, I actively select uh, 10 stocks, but for whatever reason I value weight them in the portfolio. Um, I don't have a clear understanding of how common that is among mutual funds, um, but I, th I think that's probably worth thinking about a little bit more. Do you, do you see people pursuing that sort of investment strategy of going out? Maybe, maybe you can look at funds that you, you have some a priori reason to believe they're actively managed and look at how far they deviate from value weights in practice. That might be useful. Um, so relative to active share, active weights going to tend to decrease these type 1 errors. I think most of the things, most of these um, most of these funds that are sort of actually passively managed, but uh, it would look like they're actively managed according to active weight or similar to active share. I think in general you're going to improve upon that dimension, but it doesn't go away completely. The trade-off is I think you you lose out on some of this active management. So you probably have fewer type one errors and more type two errors when you shift from active share to active weight. Um, so what did we actually capture here? Well. The first question I think we want to, I want to, I'd like to get more on is, you know, is this actually a better measure of activeness? Um, to do that, you have to define what activeness means and come up with some way of measuring it. So one idea that I had is maybe we define activeness according to the R squared. I don't want to use historical R squared because it's tough to measure. Um, you know, it's going to be noisy. I need a long time series. But maybe I can look at for all of these measures of activeness as of time t, how well do they predict R squared over the course of the next year? Um, then I can think about running a regression and seeing, well, does active weight better measure that future activeness than some of these other measures? Um, another thing I'd want to consider is, is this a more important dimension of activeness? So I, I'm looking at investment weights as opposed to which stocks to invest in. Is there some sort of theory that we could suggest as to why this might reflect more skill or um, you know, somehow be more important than stock selection? Um, I, I don't have a great story for that, but I think that the paper might benefit, or maybe future work would benefit from kind of thinking a little bit about it. Is there some theory that suggests that this is a more important decision for some reason? Um, you know, I think kind of going back to this sort of framework, I'd want to think, you know, is, the, um, is the alpha driven by the activeness, or is it driven by some of these error dimensions? Uh, I think the paper actually does a really good job of robustness checks for small stocks, which is one example of where the, uh, the, there may be some just inherent correlation between the active weight definition um, and certain characteristics of stocks. I think thinking more along that dimension would be helpful. Um, looking at stuff out of sample might be helpful as well. We just have a bunch of different measures of activeness. One of them is going to be um, deliver the best in-sample result. Yeah, one advantage of their um, of their particular measure is you can take it in a lot of different environments. So it might be nice to actually take this, uh, this measure and apply it in different settings. Um, 
So the bottom line is I'd like to have a little better understanding of what active sh weight means, uh, what dimension of activism captures, and, and how to think about that. Uh, I'll skip sort of the other suggestion. Bottom line, I think it's a good paper. I find the evidence to be quite compelling. Um, I, I think it really adds to this, uh, this literature that says when we sort funds based on activeness, the most active funds seem to outperform the least active. Um, I think it could be even better if there was some more examination of what active weight actually captures, what dimension of activeness uh, this is all about, and uh, yeah, maybe this is, uh, is compelling work for, uh, for future. For future stuff. I'll, I'll stop there. Again, really enjoyed reading the paper and appreciate the chance to discuss it.